Good morning. It's Monday, November 13th, 2023. It's a little after 1030 a.m. on the East Coast. This is Rob Sin uh, at CEO Technician on Twitter at Goldfinger on CEO.ca. And continuing with the trend of doing these on Monday morning, just the weekends for me recently have been very busy. Um, I hope to get back to doing them on Saturday or Sunday around Thanksgiving, so a couple weeks from now. But here we are. Let's get let's get right to it. We've had a breathtaking stock market rally in the last couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of this is um, predicated on the idea that positioning was really underweight stocks, a lot of cash on the sideline, and CTAs, commodity trading advisors, were leaning heavily, heavily to the short side coming into the month of November. As you can see, the positioning was about 120 billion net short uh, by CTAs. And you know, if this information is, is correct or close to being correct, there's gonna to need to be some more short covering in equities over the next week or so. Um, I see Goldman saying it's going to be about 72 billion. I'm a little skeptical it's that much, but still there could be more short covering to, to come this week. Um, QQQ had just an incredible move on Friday. Uh, you know, th this market is really something that is unique because you have stocks like Microsoft and Nvidia uh, Apple that are up almost every single day. I mean, look at Nvidia here on this chart. I think this is nine days in a row now. Uh, and that's coming after that last day in October where it uh, staged a failed breakdown. A lot of people were looking at like a head and shoulders here, breaking under 400, uh, trapped a lot of bears. A lot of shorts got trapped there. A lot of people got stopped out of their longs and look at what it's done since it's straight up. So I don't want to get too much into the broader market. I just want to say this rally is extremely powerful. And while the momentum could just die overnight, because this market has done that many a time in the past several months, uh, this is something that must be respected. And, you know, seasonality is also very favorable here through year end. So uh, I would be only dancing in and out on the short side. I would not be trying to bet big against this market. And the NIMO, uh, so this is, a, you know, a good oscillator, a good gauge of market breadth. Uh, and it can, it can be a strong indicator of overbought, oversold extremes. Uh, it, it, you know, it's interesting how it's consolidating here sort of in the middle. And while this market has had a breathtaking move higher, this is not triggering any extreme overbought signals yet. Okay. And that a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's a fairly narrow advance. Um, a lot of the QQQ components, uh, have been leading this rally. And just as I'm doing this video, we're, you know, we're moving up again. Dips continue to be bought in equities. Um, taking a look at this Bank of America, you know, report from Friday, they sort of led with this U.S.-China trade tensions chart, and U.S.-China trade has rolled over quite a bit in the last year, and you can see that. Chinese exports to the U.S. are down 18% uh, from the peak, but only down 4% to the rest of the world, right? So clearly there are trade tensions between the U.S. and China. President Xi is coming to San Francisco this week on Wednesday. So Biden and Xi will have a, a summit uh, on the sidelines of a bigger meeting. Um, I don't know what will come of that, but obviously it is important if something positive comes of that, it could obviously be positive for stocks. 
I, I think most people are kind of skeptical that anything major will um, come of it. And uh, she may see Biden as a bit of a lame duck and a president that he doesn't really want to deal with until uh, next November, right? Because we could very easily, uh, it's looking like the U.S. will have a new president based upon polling uh, in recent weeks. Uh, but that's something that definitely we will want to watch on Wednesday, what comes of that. Now, it's interesting that uh, the pivot that the market pricing has taken in the last month from expecting another rate hike in 2023 to now pricing out any further rate hikes, period. And, you know, Morgan Stanley, for example, is starting to price in four 25 basis point rate cuts in 2024. And the consensus is that the cuts will probably start around May or June of, of next year. I think, you know, with Morgan Stanley in particular, they're, they're calling for the first cut in, in May and then eight cuts in 2025. So that's another factor that has obviously helped to stimulate the stock market rise in the last couple of weeks is this major pivot in Fed expectations. Basically, the, the thinking is the Fed is done and Morgan Stanley is actually expecting uh, core PCE inflation to come back to, to 2% by the end of next year. And that's part of the reason why they think the uh, Fed will be cutting more and cutting sooner than the rest of the uh, street sees it, right? Tomorrow we'll get uh, CPI data. That will be important. Uh, the core is expected to come in at 0.3% month over month, the headline 0.1%. There are some analysts calling for a, a zero print, a flat you know, headline print, may, may, maybe even some outlier calls for a negative headline CPI print. But uh, I think all of that is pretty much priced in right now. I don't think the CPI would cause a big market move unless it was a surprise to the upside. And that would be a downside move in stocks. I, I don't really think uh, even a zero on the headline would cause um, a big move in stocks. I think, I think a lot of that is already priced in at this point. Uh, crude oil and energy stock weakness. So look at what crude has done since the end of September. It was at 95 a barrel very briefly, uh, back down to 75 last week. We're trading about 77 or 78 on WTI here this morning. My sense is this $75 a barrel level is a big support level. And my bias would be to be a buyer down here, okay? And, you know, the OIH, this is the oil services ETF. You know, we have the makings of a head and shoulders top, but you know, what I'll say here is, I think you have to go with the, the longer term trend and not just bet on a shorter term uh, chart pattern. I think that the bias is to be a buyer down here around 310, 315, on the OIH, Schlumberger actually has a prettier, you know, head and shoulders pattern. And we got to, you know, respect it. I mean, definitely the, the 50 day is now rolling over. Uh, so you want to, you want to watch this. I have no position at this point in time, but this is something, a chart that I am watching closely. What does Schlumberger do? Do you know, is this going to be a failed breakdown? Like we've seen so many times in so many other charts. Or is this just bear flagging and getting ready for the next rollover? Okay, so I think I think the oil sector is one to watch here. I'm not trading it actively at this point in time, but it is definitely on my radar. And I was reading um, the note from David Einhorn um, from his his fund uh, quarterly letter, and he makes some very interesting points that. Um, this coming year is an election year in the U.S. And 
Saudi's crown prince does not like Biden. Uh, Chinese, you know, leader Xi Jinping has refused to speak with or meet with President Biden for years. And now they're finally going to meet um, this week. And obviously Putin doesn't like Biden because Biden has supplied, you know, Ukraine with billions and billions of dollars of weapons and support. So there could be a concerted effort uh, from this sort of triad to remove Biden from office. And a lot of them look at Trump in a more favorable way. So that's interesting. And one of the ways to do that would be higher oil and gas prices. Um, and he has basically made a bet via options and futures that crude oil prices will be higher in 2024. So that is worth thinking about, worth noting. He's a very shrewd investor. His fund is crushing it this year. I think they're up like 25% uh, year to date, vastly outperforming um, the S&P 500. So crude oil might be a sector uh, to look at here as it has pulled back substantially in the last five to six weeks. Moving on, uranium, the loan mining bull market. So, you know, whether you look at base metals or precious metals, uh, even iron ore mining is out of favor very clearly. It's a cyclical sector. And this cyclical sector is telling us that the global economy is deteriorating, right? It's, it's softening. Uranium is a very unique and specific sector tied to nuclear energy and nuclear energy is having a renaissance. Um, and just this, this tremendous, uh, you know, acknowledgement globally that nuclear energy is going to play an extremely important role in the green energy transition. And we need to build more nuclear power plants and take care of the ones that we have already. Right. And, you know, the fuel for these, you know, nuclear power plants is an area of the mining sector that has seen drastic amount of underinvestment for the last decade. And now that is, is coming home to roost. So we have the under supply of U308 and Cameco being the, the number one name, the top uh, stock in the sector has been leading the charge. And this morning, it's making yet another 52 week high, another multi multi year high as it continues to trend higher. And this is just one of these bull market themes that as an investor, you really shouldn't overthink too much. Of course, there's going to be ebbs and flows. The sector is going to get really overbought at some points. It's going to get oversold at other points. Uh, the bigger picture, this is a trend. And in this case, the trend is definitely your friend. You know, we had that pretty violent shakeout at the end of September, early October, where, you know, the sector dropped like 15 to 20 percent in like four trading sessions. Yet that was yet another buying opportunity. And just notice how just looking at the CCJ and the URA charts, uh, support came in very close to the 50 day move, uh, moving average. And remember that moving averages are just, you know, informing us of the uh, broader trend, right? So the slope of the moving average was much more important than the exact price level that it was at during that, that violent shakeout. You know, we have next gen, this is the number one, I would call it a junior in the space, even though the project, the Rook One project in the Athabasca Basin of, of, of Saskatchewan is definitely a top tier project uh, worthy of a major. It's still a junior because it's not a producer, but they got their provincial uh, environmental approvals last week. And that's again, just reaffirming that Saskatchewan is one of the best jurisdictions for mining uh, in the entire world, right? <clears throat> Gold, oh, Bitcoin breakout. 
So I don't talk about crypto much, don't talk about Bitcoin much, but I have to acknowledge the chart. Bitcoin has definitely um, transitioned into a confirmed uptrend. So this is now, you know, in Weinstein stage analysis, we call this stage two. Stage two is an uptrend. Uh, Bitcoin was in a stage one bottoming process throughout the second half of 2022 and into earlier part of this year. Uh, it then transitioned around March, April into this consolidation between 25,000 and 32,000. And that was like a six month consolidation. You could call it a rectangle. And then it broke out from that uh, consolidation in October. And right now, I would say that Bitcoin has the wind at its back. And, you know, obviously, 40,000 is a round number level. There is definitely some price memory up there. But I would not be surprised to see Bitcoin uh, above 40,000 by the end of this year. And people ask me, well, how do you play crypto? How do you play Bitcoin? Well, the crypto miners are kind of like the gold miners. They're not doing very well and they have a lot of challenges that don't necessarily, I mean, so they have costs to operate their businesses. They pay big bills in the, you know, energy that they use to mine the Bitcoin, to mine the Ethereum, to, to mine whatever it is, right? Um, and it becomes harder and harder to mine, right? becomes harder, more costly. Um, and the amount of, you know, Bitcoin that they are able to mine becomes less and less. And actually one of the factors that I believe is, is helping to propel Bitcoin higher here in the last month is that there's a halving coming, uh, supposed to be next April, April of 2024. So that's going to lower the, you know, rewards for the Bitcoin miners. So I don't have a great way to play this space other than just own Bitcoin. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to advise you how much you should own, but like, for example, I have 1% of my net worth in silver. I would think of silver and, and Bitcoin in, in a similar way. That's just me. That's my opinion. You don't have to like it or agree with it, but I think 1% uh, of your of your risk equity it is a is a reasonable you know allocation just have some but don't make such a big bet that if it got cut in half it would it would cause you too much pain um and then there's people that are bitcoin maximalists like michael sailors just put everything in bitcoin you should always put your your savings and your earnings you know into bitcoin and be heavily overweighted that's his thinking and, and i guess at this exact moment in time, it's serving him well. <clears throat> um, gold miner capitulation. Uh, the GDX is down six days in a row, right? Um, there definitely is the potential that this is a head and shoulders bottom, but I want to be very clear that it's just the potential and it's nothing even close to being a confirmed pattern because even if the GDX started to move up over the next week or two, it would not confirm a breakout from the pattern, pattern until we closed above $30 a share, right? That would be the neckline, these levels from August, September, and October that served as key resistance right areas of supply where buyers sort of ran out of fuel thirty dollars is a very clear level of resistance for gdx right um right now we're just in a downtrend and we're trying to figure out where this thing is going to actually bottom i will say this i don't know the answer to that uh, i will say that seasonality is starting to become more favorable to the gold miners. I will say this sector is definitely very much hated. It's very much out of favor. It's under-owned. 
The only thing I would be concerned about here that would make me maybe not buy hand over fist is that we are in a ta- we are in tax loss selling season. And I also believe that there are some funds that maybe have some exposure to the gold mining sector that are having, you know, investors say, I want my money back, right? So they are basically sellers to lighten up and meet investor, you know, withdrawals over the next, you know, month or so. I don't know how uh, much of that is going on, but I'm sure there is some of it. And so that's what makes this so tricky. All other things being equal, I would have to view this as a buying opportunity right here, right now. But knowing that, you know, if this does get a bit worse, there could be some sort of forced selling during this tax loss period uh, over the the next month. I would expect tax loss to end uh, basically exactly one month from now, and we would get a lift in the final weeks of the year. Same thing goes for the GDXJ, the juniors. Um, The juniors are just higher beta versions of the seniors at this point. And juniors that are cash strapped that may need to raise capital in the next few months are uh, definitely the prime targets of any tax loss selling. And then the final topic, Hercules Silver. So um, Hercules Big is at 117 as we do this video. It's funny, last Monday I did this video. The stock was 119 or one. Oh, sorry, it's 122. <laughs> just jumped as I was talking. Well, anyway, we're about the same share price we were exactly one week ago. And one week ago, that uh, we were also talking about Barrick Gold uh, investing in Hercules Silver. Big, B-I-G, on the venture. Uh, so Barrick has announced this morning that they acquired 7 million warrants to purchase common shares of Hercules Silver for total consideration of 6,580,000. So if you do the math on this and you add in the 11 cent price of the warrants they purchased, Barrick paid $1.05 per share total for the 7 million shares. Well, last week they took 9.9% of the company at $1.10. So they added to it at 105. Then we know they previously bought shares on the open market. We don't know the exact share prices on those purchases, but guessing around 70 or 80 cents. Um, So put it all together, they now have 15.09% of the outstanding common shares on a non-diluted basis. And if you throw in the warrants that they acquired uh, last week, the $1.32 warrants, they have 17.61% on a partially diluted basis. Now, you know, recall from the, the, the news last Monday, um, they have an agreement that they are prohibited from acquiring more than 19.9% of the outstanding common shares of Hercules Silver. So they're at uh, 15.09 right now, and then 17.61 on a partially diluted basis. So overall, you can see at 122 per share, the market likes this news this morning in, uh, in, in big, right? Now, turning to the chart, I'm pulling up the weekly chart. This is not real time. This is a little bit, this is uh, 15 minutes pause. Uh, on stockcharts.com. But I got some questions in the last few days. Isn't this really overbought? Like, isn't big just way too overbought here? Um, It's got to go down, right? Well, (laughs) nothing has to do anything. And in the best stocks, the best ones, the strongest ones, overbought is a good thing. It's bullish, right? It's actually bullish. The weekly RSI 14 is at 91. Yes, that is that is extremely high, no doubt about it. But I want to show you an example from many years ago 
NXE, this is next gen. We were just talking about this sector and this company earlier. This is from 2015, 2016, 2017 timeframe. So obviously, you know, next gen made a new, uh, you know, discovery, very uh, big deal at the Rook One project in Saskatchewan. And this was at the time when that, you know, new discovery was becoming something really special and world class. So from the end of 2015, it went from about 50 cents a share to $2 and 75 cents a share by about April of 2016. So we're talking about a five month period. It did a more than five X and look at the weekly RSI 14. It got above 90. And yeah, so it, it kind of topped out above 90. I mean, it can only go to 99, but look at what the, the share price did. So for the next several months, it kind of just tread water side, sideways for like four months. It traded between like 225 and 275, just going up and down a bit. Yes, then it did have a pretty significant, uh, you know, drawdown there at the end of 2016, along with a lot of other mining stocks. But then look at what it did at the end of 2016 and early 2017. It made a new high. Uh, getting out to almost 450 a share in February 2017. So this is from 50 cents to 450. So that's a 9x over a little less than a year and a half in next gen. And at 50 cents, it wasn't a small, it wasn't a small company anyway. Okay, it had a pretty good market cap at 50 cents. Well, it had a very much bigger market cap at 275 and much, much bigger at four at 450. And so this is an example. I'm not saying this is what Hercules is going to do at all, but this is an example of the best stocks with the best project, you know, new discovery that is of a world class nature. This is what the stocks can do. So, you know, next gen got overbought. In February 2016, it got more overbought in March and it got even more overbought in April and the stock price just kept going up. So you cannot just simply say it's overbought, it's got to go down. Overbought can get more overbought as the share price continues to trend higher. Now, I want to just end with one thing about Hercules. So they updated a couple slides and their presentation and this one caught my attention it caught some other people's attention to this light green area the shaded area the core copper porphyry target area so here's frog pond this little area here's hercules ridge and hercules at it so these are the areas that we've been focused on but look at the target area, okay? And all of that sits inside of the broader property claims package, right? But this is a very big scale. Look, this is 1,000 meters. I'm, I'm not gonna get this exactly right, but I'm guessing this is about six to 7,000 meters wide by, you know, seven to 8,000 meters tall. And, and I could be understating it there, but this is a very big target area. Now I can't wait to hear the company explain to us how they came up with this target area and what's guiding them to this target area. But it is multiples larger than the silver lead zinc target area. So this is, this is very big and it kind of helps to put the pieces of the puzzle together why Barrick is so urgently trying to acquire uh, more and more shares. So that's it for me on this Monday morning. I hope you have a powerful trading week. And as usual, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel at Goldfinger Capital.